working through. Now you got to understand something. I'm not going to go on too long, but you got to understand something. I I'm, I'm naturally, I'm going about to tell you, I'm not apologizing for it, but I'm about, I know, I just feel it in my spirit. When I get to preaching this morning, I'm just going to be so full of passion. I can just feel it. I know it's coming. And I'm not apologizing for it. I'm just letting you know ahead of time what kind of person I am. You're not going to get some reserved dude up here. Some some guy that's going to be all quiet and soft and gentle. I'm going to just speak it the way the Lord gives it to me. Now, I have to admit to you that part of it is because that's just the way God made me. Hallelujah. I told the story before, but one time my daddy came and watched me play in a football game. And I, it's called shot, I shot the gap. I hit the quarterback before the ball even got to him. He dropped the ball, and I jumped on the ball, and my daddy started hollering. He had just got new false teeth, and his teeth flew out of his mouth. Then he reached out there, and he grabbed him out there, and he stuck him back in, and my sister was like, Daddy, kind of excited. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, one day, about five years later, after he was at the house, and my sister was talking about Jesus, he said, well, I'll tell you, I think you can just get a little bit too excited about this church stuff. And she said it was all right for you to get excited about football where your teeth came flying out your head. But it's not okay for us to get excited about Jesus. I'm here to tell you something this morning. Dead, dry, false religion is not the way that you want to go. Amen. When you get a hold of Jesus and, and, the, and the resurrected Savior that overcame death, hell, and the grave, and he enters into your heart, he's going to give you a new song on the inside. Amen. And he's going to, I'm telling you, you're going to feel a pep in your step. The love of God will change. The love of God will heal. The presence of God is a game changer. Amen? Amen. So we're not apologizing this morning. We're excited. We believe that we have tapped into something real. And I'm about, I want to tell you about it this morning. Amen. As a matter of fact, my message this morning is power from God. We're going to be reading out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. You know already that I'm always grateful when the Lord... Uh, when the Lord re reveals to me that I was on the right track, you know, many times it's in a song. This time the Lord gave me two confirmations. One was like really almost not unbelievable, but like really so God. I, I don't know if y'all have recognized that African-American couple that's been coming and they operate in the gifts. They, they're not here today. They travel around. But anyway, I had I had already started working on my message the day before this happened. And it was out of this passage of scripture. And then he sent me a video. And I started watching the video, and that was the main verse. And I had just worked some more on my message. I started this video at 320. My last update on my message was 152. And I was like, are you even serious? But that's how God is. And then while we were praying, I mean, Angie didn't know. She was just praying, and she right. said, she said, you know what? A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's what we're talking about this morning. The but I'm talking to you about a power from God. You ready? Let's go. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 9, let it also be known that in this church we believe that the Word of God is just what I said it is. It is the living Word of God. Yes. I talked to a lady yesterday. I went to her house. I walked in her house and she was paralyzed. She was her, 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 I stirred her pork chop spaghetti. I fed her dog. I put water in the dog's bowl. I prayed with her. Her past history or career was a neurophysiologist. Can you even pronounce that? We're talking about somebody with a doctorate degree in neurophysiology. She'd been in 46 different countries. She had received a strep infection. It caused an abscess in her brain. It affected her right parietal lobe. And then so therefore she was paralyzed in the left side of her body. And so basically after wanting to do all these things that she asked of me, I said, in all of your scientific knowledge, what have you ascertained about God? She said, I believe that God is real. And so I began to minister to her and I began to talk to her about the word of God and I prayed with her. But one of the things that I said was this, ma'am, you're more smart than I'll ever be. But let me say this. The way that I see it is, is that the Bible is the word of God. What the Bible says is the literal. It was. Yes, it was written through the hands of men, but God, through his spirit, used them as vessels upon which this very word was written. And I'm here to tell you, God doesn't have to prove himself to science. No, science is beyond the curve and it has to prove itself to God. And let me tell you something. We live in the midst of a world where you cannot believe scientists. I'm here to tell you that the majority of scientists want to obscure and want to hide the truth of God. I gave her Facebook. I hope you're tuning in this morning, man. And I listen, I'm just here to tell you that there, there is a spirit upon this earth. 
It's called the spirit of Antichrist. Yes. And it is trying to, de not trying, it's doing a good job of deception, of deceiving, and preventing people to come to the truth of the knowledge of God. This spirit has been in existence from the beginning of time, and it will be until Jesus comes to rule and reign upon the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. Then everything's going to change. So you might not understand why we sing about the love of God. You might not understand because I'm telling you we have encountered a God that is real and he is full of love and he will transform your life. And many times we still are so interconnected with the world that the world is the one that's speaking to us and we're confused in our mind and we still have a desire to go towards the things of the world. So it prevents us from fully going after the things of God. Lord, help us yeah. is all I can say because listen. Ain't picking on nobody. We're talking about the preacher too. The, the spirit of Antichrist wants to draw us all away yeah. from the presence of God. And that's what Paul wrote in this letter to young Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. And Paul wrote this letter. Now, when I'm going to explain the context in a little bit. But you got to understand that Paul is writing a letter to exhort and to encourage a young pastor in the Lord. And this is what he says. You ready? 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This know also that in the last days. Now you may, I'm here to tell you that I believe we're in the last days. We were in the last days ever since Jesus came on the earth. Yes. But I'm telling you it's getting right. Yes. It's getting more and more right. Amen. In the last days, perilous times are going to come. Perilous, hard, fierce, hard to bear. Perilous times shall come. Why? For men, and this is what you can look for in men. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Look at this. This is the key verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. The idea is to avoid them, to shun them. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, Led away with diverse lusts. Literally in this time frame, I believe what the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy about is that you have false teachers in your midst that are showing up in the houses of women that are bound up by sin and are vulnerable and they're taking advantage of them and they're extorting. But listen to me, it's happening the same way today and it's happening through the television. It's happening through false preachers and false teachers that are on television that move into not just women but men's living rooms and are preaching an untrue message that actually tantalizes the flesh and causes people to go towards a message that is untrue and causes a further level of bondage, a further level of imprisonment, and never giving them the opportunity to truly be set free. I believe that with all of my heart. It says this, that they're ever learning, verse 7, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, we're going to talk about that a little bit, Janus and Jambres. So do these, talking about these preachers, these false teachers, these men that have all these adjectives connected to their person. So do these also resist the truth. They're men of corrupt minds. They're reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Just to let you know, we don't have to try to fix everything. God is going to let it work out in the end. God is going to reveal who's of the Lord and who's not. Look, so I want you to know this letter was written again by the Apostle Paul right before he died. Where was he when he wrote this letter? He was in a prison called the Maritime Prison in Rome. You can Google it right now if you want to because it's still, it's, it's, it's still there. And, and, and you can go see where Peter and Paul were imprisoned in the Maritime Prison. And if you look at it, because I, I Googled it again this morning. It's been a while since I looked at it. it. They've made a shrine out of it. They built a church on top of it now. But when you look at the actual room, you can tell it's chiseled away like in rock. And it's a dungeon. It's deep down in the ground. And you can imagine when there was no electricity what it was like. It was cold. It was dark. It was damp. 
The Apostle Paul is sitting in this in this room by himself. You think you know about loneliness? You think we know about depression? The Apostle Paul feels as though he's all alone, but at the same time, the Spirit of God has called him to do a work, and he writes a letter to young Timothy to encourage him. He actually knows that he's about to die. This is the very last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Later on, in the end of the letter, he says, bring the cloaks, bring the cloak for his warmth, because it was called, bring the, bring the parchments. It means the scriptures, my writings, so that I can study the Word of God. He probably had a candle that he could read by. And he's in the midst of this particular environment, right? Sometimes we find ourselves in seasons in our life where it's dark and it's dank and it's cold and we don't know how it is that we're going to get out of there. I'm here to tell you that God's got a plan. He's got a will for your life, amen. He wants to bring you out. He wants to bring you through. He's got a calling for your life. He wants to do a work in you, amen. amen. Yet even in this place and condition, again, the light of God moves on his heart and in his spirit he speaks to him and he speaks through him and he says, I need you, Paul. I never said it would be easy. I told you you would have to suffer many things for my name's sake. Well, I'm not done with you yet. I need you to warn my people about these times. The things you see now will only worsen as my church nears the end. And so he wrote about the times that would come. The times that would be perilous. A word descriptive of harshness and difficulty to endure. He then described the inner nature of these people that would be present during this time. It should be noted that outwardly they looked the part. That's what makes it confusing, church. Outwardly they looked the part. They have a form of godliness until you were able to observe their behavior more closely. You see, there's clues. And sometimes we can be besotted. That's another word for, say, intoxicated. Spiritually intoxicated, sp unable to see, and we perceive only what we see on the outside, and we don't take the time to perceive what's really going on and the clues that are being given to us that's coming out from the inside. It says, in addition, they were ever trying to learn something new, but never coming to the truth of God's word. The reasoning here is surely twofold, and I'll get into that in a second. You can actually turn to 2 Timothy 4. Verse 3, and we're going to talk about why it's twofold. I'm about to show it to you in a second. But I want to point out to you, they were always looking for something new. The reality of it is, is that this kind of thing is still prevalent in the modern church. People are always looking for a new fad. Oh, it's a purpose driven. Your best life now. This guy over here is giving words. People are falling out and people are running. And now they're shaking and now they're doing this. I'm not trying to come and get. Look, God knows what's of God. But I'm here to tell you that it, from the beginning all the way into the end, there's another spirit that's trying to make things look godly on the outside. But the reality of it is, is that it's never changing people on the inside because the ultimate, the ultimate spirit behind it is not the spirit of truth, but instead it is a spirit of corruption. It says right here, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. So the reasoning behind this is a twofold. Number one, they heap to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. So they're finding teachers that are going to tell them something that they want to hear. The word itching there, I know I've explained it before, but it literally means pleasant words. Nowadays, churches or pulpits are filled with people that all they want to hear are pleasant words. Tell me something good that's going to make me feel good about myself. When I walk out of here, I want to feel better than when I came. I got to tell you something. You can feel better than the way that you came in Jesus name. You right. can feel better whenever you allow repentance right. to grab a hold of your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you in the air of your life that isn't lining up with him. And in a true heart of repentance, you say, Lord, I need you to do something on the inside of me. I need you to change me. And the word of God Lord. says in the book of Acts that refreshing will come whenever there's true repentance. That's the will of God. Not me just standing up here giving you encouraging words, speak, speaking like a motivational speaker, telling you sweet, pleasant things that make you feel the way that you want to feel. That is not the will of the Lord. That's number one. They make piles for themselves, preachers that are going to give them only pleasant words, what they want to hear. Number two, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they will be turned to fables. I can tell you that a part to these days are already upon us. Yes, they were present during Paul's time and they were present even before, but they are becoming more prevalent and more perilous every day we wake up. 
Churches in America are filled with people who for some reason want to connect themselves to some structure or system that has a form of something that looks like God, but they didn't really want to connect themselves to the truth. The truth will convict you in your sin. The truth will change your heart and soften you towards God and turn you from the ways of the world. The truth will show you where you were wrong and teach you where to go. Amen. Amen. I said the truth will show you where you were wrong and it will teach you where you are to go. See, that's one of the biggest things that the Lord has revealed to me as a pastor is that he is the great pastor. He is the good shepherd. He is the door to the sheep. He is the access point to the presence of God. You're not going to hear the voice of God without Jesus, the door that leads to God. My job as a pastor is to lead you how to have a relationship with Jesus, where to put your faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. That opens up the door and lets you in. That gives you access to the presence of God. But preacher, you keep saying that. I don't understand. Well, hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. Keep keeping your faith in Christ and what he's already done for you because it opens up a door and it allows you access into the presence of God where you can hear the voice of God, where you will be able to hear the still, small voice of God and he will be your pastor. And the word of God says, the Lord is my pastor. He is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. Hallelujah. He restores my soul. He leads me to green pastures. Amen. So that I can be fed. So that I can feel tranquility and peace on the inside of my heart. He is the great shepherd. He is the pastor of our soul. Amen. And that's what we need to learn is how to trust in him. This is what this text is saying. They would have an outward form of godliness. They would ever be learning, running over here to learn, running over there to learn. Here's a word. There's a word. Here's something new. But in all their running, there was no real learning. And if there's no real learning revelation, I'm talking about of the spirit of truth. And guess what? There can be no true freedom. John chapter 8, verse 32. I'm talking about, I want to talk to you about, I'm talking to you this morning. I haven't even got there yet. Just bear with me about the power of God. The word of God says in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Sometimes I'll probably over explain everything that I do. But let me just tell you one time I was sitting in my side yard and I was like, Lord, what do you mean? This was probably 10 years ago. Lord, what do you mean by you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free? All I know to do is to tell you what the Lord spoke to my spirit. On every page of my word, there is truth. The word of God says that if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have committed adultery. That is true. But knowing that is not the truth that's going to set you free and help you walk in that truth. Come on. The truth that will set you free is to know that I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one. I went to the cross. I paid the penalty for your sin when you put faith in me. An exchange took place. Come on, somebody. Don't worry to work with me here. An exchange took place. I took your guilt. I gave you my righteousness. And now that you have my righteousness, you can enter into the presence of the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord, there is freedom and there is liberty. That is the truth that will set you free. Hallelujah. Well, why isn't it working, preacher? Because it requires surrender on our part. And this old man don't want to die. Right. This flesh wants to live. Amen. And the enemy, it's not even in my notes, but I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, is a master at doing CPR on our old man. Yeah. Yeah. He knows how to breathe, try to breathe life back to that old man. Yeah. Lord, help us to realize, amen, that we don't want to live like the old man. We want to live like the new man in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. The word know there means to become acquainted with, to know, to know the truth that's going to set you free. So the people described in our passage are those who in the last days, look, they call themselves Christians and call themselves preachers of the gospel. And we're going to look a little more closely at what they look like. But I have to tell you that you cannot always tell from a superficial observation because outwardly, again, they look one way, a form of godliness. But inwardly, there's something else. I'm not going to break down every one of these adjectives because I'd have to keep you here all morning. But I picked some that pointed out to me. You ready? Number one, they're lovers of self. They love themselves. I mean, I know we're all supposed to love ourselves to some extent. <laughs> Amen. But no, 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 this is wrong. They love themselves in a way they just ought not love themselves. 
A lover of self is so fond of self that his decisions are always based on what's best for him instead of what's best for God. Instead of what's best for others around him. He comes first and he must be served before anyone else. If my decision hurts you, oh well, I want what I want and I want it now. That's a lover of self instead of a lover of God. The next three adjectives are all connected to one of the adjectives. He's a boaster, he's proud, and he's high-minded. I'm being gender specific, but hey, look, if you're a girl and it fits you, you can go ahead and grab a hold of it, right? Hey, I'm, I'm just saying him. I'm just using the male masculine pronoun, but it's for humanity. Yes. Let's just break it down a little bit. The first one, proud. He's got an elevated estimate of himself. He walks around with the thought in his mind that he is elevated above others. This contradicts the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. But he's proud. And he has an elevated thought of himself. He doesn't just think he's higher or better in his mind, but he talks about it. He's a boaster. He talks about, it. and look, it's not like we're talking about Michael Jordan here. I mean, Michael Jordan just straight up dunk on you and talk trash in your face. Well, he was the best. He, what he was saying was real. Was it right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, he was. It was legit. <laughs> he really was the best, and he and he would tell you that he was the best, and he would tell you didn't know exactly what he was saying, but you could tell to see his lips were moving out. Oh, after he shoved that ball on top of your head. There's one thing when a person is really that good and they're boasting about themselves. But, you know, most of the time people that boast is because they're not convinced they're really that good. And they're trying to convince everybody else around them that they're that good. And that's what the person that's full of pride does if he's boasting about himself all of the time, ele trying to elevate himself. He uses words to talk about how good he is, but he's really not as good as what he pretends. He's high-minded. Boy, I like this word right here because it gives you an idea of something. And you know what it means? It means to cover in mist. It means like a wisp of smoke surrounding your head. You can't see it in the spiritual realm, but it's almost like somebody walking around so full of pride. I can remember one time there was a commercial on TV, and this old boy steps outside of his truck, and he's real cool looking. And all of a sudden, he like takes his, his key, his keyless entry thing, and he, and he locks the door, and he's walking, boy. He's all suave and cool. And then all of a sudden, a baseball, I think it was, comes and hits his windshield, and his alarm goes off. And that was pretty funny. Like, it just really deflated him real quick. But I get this picture in my mind of somebody that's high-minded, that's so proud, that's boasting of himself. And he thinks he's so cool and so awesome that he literally has a mist around him. And this mist over his head has besotted him. In other words, it's put him in a drunken state, spiritually speaking. And he don't even he can't even realize who he is, what he looks like, how far away he really is from where God would want him. He is convinced that he is what he says he is, when in reality he is not. This is what he is too. He's a blasphemer. See, most of the time when we hear this word blaspheme, we think of it as connected to God. But in reality, it's also connected to the way some people speak to other people. And listen to me, there's a possibility that some of us in this room might see a little bit of this. In each and every one of our own lives. And that would be the Holy Spirit revealing to us. Hey, whether it's the preacher. Sometimes you act like that. Maybe you got a mist on top of your head, brother. Maybe you need to recognize where you are. I'm just using myself as an example. Because it's easier for you if I do such a thing. Amen. <laughs> But maybe you might hear one of these adjectives that describe you. So a blasphemer isn't just one who speaks a certain way towards God, but a blasphemer also speaks towards other people that way. And what he does is, is this. He speaks in an evil, slanderous way. He uses words to destroy someone's names. He's reproachful, which means to find fault and to discredit. Do you do that? Do you always look for fault in someone? Are you trying to discredit them? He's railing. What does that mean? To speak with force and bitterness towards someone. Right, right. That's not the word of the Lord. That's not the voice of God. Mm -hmm. To speak forcefully and bitter towards someone, sourly, to tear them down, to, 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 to deprecate them, to tear. No, that's not the will of God. He's abusive. He uses harsh and injurious words, whether they're, they're words that are harmful and hurt other people. Just a real quick scripture, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, meaning to build up. 
that it may minister grace to the hearer. See, God, through the Apostle Paul, would tell us to speak good words, to speak pleasant words. Yes, not word. I know I'm not trying to contradict myself from what I said earlier. Words of truth. Words that are that are true of the gospel, words that are good, though, in such a way that they're that they are carried by love. Even whenever we preach the word of God in a corrective tone, it's because it's the love of God that desires to correct us. Amen. Amen. Look at this scripture right here. Lovers of pleasure more than God. I know I like to write on the board, but I think I'm just going to spare you today. Well, maybe not. I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, so this word right here is. This is how you would. Spell it, philodonis, and it comes from two words, phileo. Does anybody know what that word means? Phileo, that's where we get the word Philadelphia. It means brotherly love, or it can also be interpreted as fondness. Okay? You know where this word comes from? Donis, it comes from hedonism. It's where we get our English word hedonism. You know what that word means? Hedonistic. It means fleshly. The idea between Philodonus, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, means that the end result is that I desire my happiness. Mm. Whatever it is that makes me happy, whatever it is that I do that makes me happy, whatever stimulates my pleasure centers, come on somebody, whether it's another touch, whether it's another drink, whether it's another tape, whether it's another gossip, whether it's another whatever, when I do this, it causes a boost of serotonin to flood the, I'm getting all physiological on you, to flood the synapses of my brain, and it makes me feel mm -mm good. <laughs> and I want to do it again, and I want to do it again, but the problem is, is that when I'm doing it, it's contrary to the will of God. Right. And if the truth of the Lord doesn't come forth, you could find yourself living and sitting in a place of sin, and all you're worried about is stimulating the pleasure centers of your brain because all you're worried about is receiving happiness for yourself. Right. And the whole time God would say, but I want to be pleased. I am the God of all creation. I am the one who you're supposed to be living your life for. And if you will give me the opportunity, I will move by my spirit in your life. Yes. Amen. Yes. And I will yes. give pleasure to your life. Yes. It will be, become pleasing to you to serve me, yes. to live for me. Amen. To walk with me and to work for me. See, this is the main verse that the Lord put on my heart. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He says, from such turn away. The adjectives just defined are the actual nature of the people described. Some people will straight up tell you. Now, sometimes I want to show you a little difference. This is, this is true. This is what's in, some of this is in me, but there's a part of me that loves it. There's a part of me that hates it, and I want freedom from it. That's a little different. That's, that's somebody that's struggling in the middle of sin. That's somebody that's struggling with things in their life, and they're wanting freedom, but they find it difficult to be free. God will work with a heart like that. That heart just needs to keep coming to the Lord and keep telling him, Lord, I don't want to be this way. Amen. I want to be the way that you want me to be. Would you do the work on the inside of my heart? Amen. That's a little different. That what I'm talking about is people that literally think that they're okay with the Lord and that they're happy with the way that they're living. They have a form, a morphosis. There's an outward form that presents itself as godly, but inwardly, these are the things they are. From these, God says, shun and avoid them. Then he gives us an illustration. He says, Janus and Jambres. See, these were magicians in Pharaoh's court. We know the story in Exodus, who they opposed Moses with their magic, and the magic they performed convinced the people around them that this power was good. You, you remember the story that had wooden staffs, and God told Moses, throw your staff on the ground, and it turned into a snake. Well, then the magician turned right around, and he threw his staff on the ground, and it turned into a snake. The point being is, is I need you to understand something. Well, as a matter of fact, let me just do it through, through this particular scripture out of Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. I want you to know that the enemy has power. The enemy has power to cause spiritual things to happen. The enemy has power to cause things to look like they would be from God to the point where it causes deception in people's lives. Look what it says in Revelation 13, 11 through 14. He said, I beheld another beast. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about the false prophet. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. 
and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. He causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. The main thing I wanted you to see is this. Is that just because you're seeing things moving and shaking. Just because you have seen things that look like they're miraculous. Just because you see things that look like they're supernatural. It does not mean that it's coming from God. It does not mean that it's coming from the spirit of the Lord. And this is the word of God. God wants you and I to know that the enemy also has power. And sometimes we can get caught. And on the outside it looks like it is from the Lord. Look at this. Here's an example. I mean, you can turn to it, 1 Kings 18, 25 through 32, but I'm just going to tell you the story for sake of time. This is the story where it talks about, and I've used it a lot in my messages, and, I'm, and the other story I'm going to tell you, I've used it a lot in my messages, because these are two classic z examples in the Old Testament that remind us of certain things that could be going on in the modern church. In this particular story, we're talking about Elijah the prophet, we're talking about the Israel king Ahab, and the fact that he married a woman named Jezebel. Jezebel was a sorceress. And what Jezebel did was she brought a bunch of prophets of Baal, which was a false god, into the house of God, if you will. And it went on for so long that it caused confusion to the people. The people thought they were worshiping God, but what they were really doing was worshiping a false god. And Elijah came to Mount Carmel to have a showdown because the people are confused. The people have been deceived by another spirit. And God wants his people to be released and to be freed from something that is false and to give them something that is real. And what the, what the prophet Elijah does is he tells them to go ahead and to prepare an altar and to call upon their God. And if you'll remember the story, they start dancing, they start howling, they start doing all kinds of stuff we shouldn't really talk about in church. They start cutting themselves. They start doing, there's all kinds of movement going on. But in that particular case, God said, no, the hand of the enemy will not move today because I'm going to prove myself. And the hand of the enemy did not move but yet whenever Elijah began to call upon the God of Israel, what happened? Fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice that was on the altar. And there, there's, another, there's another step in that to, to be reminded that the truth of the gospel is always connected to the sacrifice of the Lord. Amen. There's another story, though. So I, that, what I wanted you to see in that is a bunch of movement, a bunch of confusion, a bunch of deception. Just because you see spiritual movement going on doesn't mean that it's of the Lord. But people were confused. You would say, well, I would know the difference between worship and Baal. Now, if you had grown up in all that all your life, why do you think Jehovah's Witnesses don't know what in the world they're involved right. in? Why do you think more Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus isn't deity? Mormons say that Jesus is Satan's, is Lucifer's brother. But if you've been raised in that all of your life and you don't know any better, you believe that to be true. To you and I, it sounds preposterous. But these four people have been bound and brought up under a false spirit that has deceived them. And just because we don't believe that in the modern church, there's a big spiritual deception that takes place in the modern church. And it's not connected to the truth of the gospel that's supposed to be preached. My other story comes out of, is a story about David. And I tell it all the time because it's my favorite story. Example two, it's a display of church. 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 10. And you can turn there, but I'm just going to tell you the story. You know the story, you remember, right? Mm -hmm. That for 40 days mm -hmm. and 40 nights, Goliath is taunting the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel set up on one side of a valley. Goliath and the Philistines are set up on the other side. The Bible says this. You've got to just imagine it in your mind. That every day, every morning, Israel wakes up and they put on their clothes. They get, they, and they get set up in battle array. What does that mean? I'm not, I never was much of a service person. I went to military school, but I got kicked out. But what it's talking about is they would set themselves up in proper formation. Battle array. They got dressed. They got their armor on. They're in proper formation. Then it says they would shout the battle cry. It's kind of like before football game. We used to get fired up and slap each other in the helmet. Like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this today. We're going to win, right? And so they're all fired up. And they're ready to win. It's a pep rally. We're ready to go. We're about to get up in this game. We're about to take it to the enemy. We're about to take 
take this by force. And then all of a sudden, old sleepy Goliath gets up. And he comes over there and he hollers across the valley. His big old shadow cast across the valley and they're cowering now. And he's like, send me a man to fight. And they all sit back down. <laughs> and then they go back to sleep. And you know, the Lord spoke it to me, and I know it's probably boring for you, but the Lord spoke it to me many years ago. He says, this is my church half the time. Yes. They're getting dressed up. They come to church on Sunday. They hoot and they holler. And all this kind of movement going on. But the reality of it is, is that they're not trusting me according to my word to believe that I can give them victory over the giants that are in their lives. And young David, man, the Bible, when he showed up, he saw this. And what did he say? He said, he said, is there not a cause? Hey, amen. <laughs> Are you going to sit here and continue to live like this? Oh, no, the Lord will give me the head of this uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> and he goes down there and he grabs five rocks, right? And one of them sunk in the head of the enemy. Praise God, he cut the head of that giant off. And he, he's a type of Christ. That has come to give us victory. And in Christ, you and I are more than conquerors. All I know to do is to keep telling you the truth. That the victory has already been won for you. That Jesus died on the cross to break the power of yes. sin. And whatever the giant is in your life, I don't care how ugly it is, how big it is, how mean it looks. Whatever that giant is that has prevented you from getting closer to the will of God and the presence of God, it dies in the name of Jesus. Right. It's a finished work, church. He's already done it. Victory in Jesus. Amen. My Savior forever. Well, he bought me. He what? He, he, he bought me beneath the cleansing flow, something like that. All I know is, is that his blood was shed. Yes, Lord. His blood was shed and there's victory. I should not all try to sin, especially if I don't know the word. He bought me, and I don't want to say taught me, but that's probably he in the right. He, he what? Sought me. sought me. He looked for me. I was in a dark alley somewhere, and I was lost. Hallelujah, but the Lord sought me, and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Hallelujah. And I know the rest of that song ought to say something, so I'm going to live for him. And I know that ain't the right word, but I know that's what it's saying. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to go after him. The apostle Paul said that I got to apprehend that by which I've been apprehended. Have you been apprehended this morning? Has the spirit of God grabbed a hold of you? Because if he hasn't, you probably think the preacher's pretty weird. But I'm here to tell you that if the Holy Ghost will apprehend you, if he get a hold of you, I'm here to tell you he'll give you a new hope. He'll give you a new focus on life. No longer will you want the old things that you wanted. But instead you'll want to know the one that loved you and showed up and changed you. Amen. I don't want to just have church. I want to believe God. Amen. And the first, the people of God had come under the spell of Jezebel. You could say that another spirit of another kind had led the people astray and they literally thought they were serving God when the spiritual influence that they had submitted themselves under was actually satanic in origin. Mm -hmm. The spirit of Antichrist transforms himself as an angel of light. He takes on the form of God. He talks like God. He uses scripture. But there's no power for change. God will never leave you the way that you are. He will never wink at sin and pretend that it's okay. God's word has called his people to be separate. In the second, the story, the people had no power against their enemy, but you know the story. Hallelujah. Young David gave victory. Jesus has given victory. Yes. The church is free according to the word of the Lord. We just got to know it and believe it yes. and begin to walk in it. Hallelujah. Young David, this is what he said. You come at me with spear and sword, but I come at you in the, the name, name of the Lord. Lord. You fall today, giant. Mm. So I wanted to get, I'm talking to you about the power of God this yes. morning. The dunamis. Because there's a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. This is the word in the Greek. You ready? Dunamis. I know y'all heard of it before, some of you. What, what you imagine, what English word do we get from this? Dynamite. That's right, dynamite. All right? We get the word dynamite from there, but can I tell you it doesn't mean dynamite? Because see, dynamite wasn't created until about 100 to 200, 150 years ago. This word in the Greek language was here before Jesus was even born in the flesh. The point being is, is that the word dunamis was already here. The point being is that the word dunamis has meaning. And the meaning of the word dunamis is inherent power. Mm. That there's power contained within to do. Mm. There's power contained within. Well, let me just talk like Larry the Cable Guy for a second. To get her done. There's power contained within to accomplish 
what God desires to be accomplished. It describes inherent power, the capability to do. So here we go. Here's an illustration. You ready? Dynamite. Discovered about 150 years ago, like I said. Here we are. We're laying track for a railroad. We've got to connect the east to the west. There's a mountain in the way. Guess what? That mountain's got to come out the way. Within a stick of dynamite is the power to do. Mm -hmm. The power to remove the mountain so that we can continue to progress and move right. forward. You might be walking your journey of Christianity and you come up to a mountain. Right. Oh, look, Zerubbabel in the Old Testament said, Oh, mountain, you will fall. I speak grace grace unto you and this mountain will be removed i'm trying to talk to you about a dunamis i'm trying to talk to you about a power that's so much more power than the inherent power of dynamite i'm here to tell you this morning that the power of the holy spirit can remove mountains and giants that are in your life hallelujah and god wants to do it for you the power to do look at john chapter 15 verse 5 this is jesus right here he says to the church, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen. Within the power of God is the power to do. Disconnected from Jesus, you can do nothing. The scripture describes to us that the believer is like a branch connected to a vine. Jesus is divine, we're the branch, and just like sap, the Holy Spirit flows through the vine into the branch, and the power to do produces fruit in the branch. God wants to give you through the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has already done that allowed you to be planted into Christ. Do you understand that when you put faith in Christ, that's what happened, you were planted into Christ? That the old man that was born of sin and Adam was born dead to the things of God. But if you are born again, are you born again this morning? Amen. I don't even know what that means, preacher. Okay, well, let me tell you. There was a time, a night, there was a night one time. And there was a religious leader. He was a man of the cloth. He was a religious leader and he came to Jesus because he saw all of the miracles that Jesus had been performing. And he said, oh, rabbi, rabbi, great teacher. Look at all these things you do. And you know what Jesus said? Yeah, I don't think he said time out, but this is what he did. He, he didn't answer his question. He didn't acknowledge his phrase. He said, verily, verily, truly, truly, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God and he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you must be born again. And if you are born again, I'm here to tell you that you've been connected to the vine. That's the point I'm trying to make. You might not understand everything that I'm talking about, but guess what? This is a lifelong process of learning. That's right. Amen. You have to avail yourself to learn the word of God. You learned the ways of the world, did you not? You learned all the songs and your music from the world, did you not? You still remember the lyrics to songs that you used to listen to. Even, I mean, I'm saying if you don't listen to them anymore. You still remember the, some of those songs. You still remember the message that was being preached to you. That's not the message of God. To live according to your flesh, to live for drugs and alcohol, to live for all this other kind of stuff. I'm not going to start singing those songs, but you get the point. Remember your favorite one and think about the message that it's saying. Mm. It was a different message. You remember all that? Yeah. It's a lifelong process of learning the things of God. To understand the ways of God, the word of God. Right. Amen? And you have to avail yourself to those things. Amen. And if you're not interested in it, you'll never learn it. Right. If you're not interested in the things of God, you'll never have the desire to learn the things of God. But if you're born again, you're connected to the vine. And through that vine into the branch is flowing the spirit of God. Yeah. Producing the power of God in you so that you can do. Spiritually, what to expect this power to look like. You ready? I want to tell you this. Faith and belief or trust is the detonator for dunamis. I was like... This is how silly I am. I Googled, man, that's a good little thought. What was that little, that little thingy that made the dynamite go off? Couldn't even think of the word. <laughs> detonator, duh. Faith is the detonator for the dunamis. Mm. See, without faith, you don't access the dunamis. Right. Without faith, you don't access the power of God. What do you mean by faith? Trusting that God can do what he said that he can do. Right. Amen? Look at this scripture right here, Matthew 13 and 58. He did not many mighty works there because, what? Of their unbelief. 
to believe that God can do what he said that he can do. In this verse, Jesus had gone back to Nazareth in Galilee where he was raised. And you know what the people there, you know what about them? They knew of him, but they did not know him. Isn't this Mary's boy? Isn't this Joseph the carpenter's boy? What's the big deal with this? They knew about him, but they didn't really know him. And because they did not know him, they could not believe. And because they could not believe, the dunamis was not detonated and very little was accomplished there. You can't just know about him. You have to know him and believe that his work was enough to set you free in order to believe, in order to see, in order to be set free. Amen? Amen. A couple of things real quick. I'm about to wrap it up. You ready? The dunamis of God reverses the curse. Praise God. I want you to see this. Look at Luke 9, 1 real quick. It says, then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Look at Luke 10 and 19. Behold, I give unto you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'm here to tell you that the dunamis will give you victory and power over the works of evil. What Jesus has done, I don't have time to break it down with scripture this morning. But what Jesus did at the cross paid the penalty for sin. And it releases into your life grace and victory that can give you victory over demon spirits. If you don't believe in demon spirits, sweetheart, come back and see me in a couple of years. Come back and see me in five more years. Lord, my prayer for your life is that you would not be ravaged in that time. My prayer for your life is that God would sustain you and build a hedge of protection around you. But that he would also reveal to you that there is a supernatural and a spiritual world in which we live. And you can sit here and you can walk blindly all you want to. But you are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. You ain't going to put on some boxing gloves and try to fight this. No, the only way you're going to fight this is falling to your knees and crying out and surrender and crying out on the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ who went before you as young David and he brought the victory over the giant in your life and to trust it and to believe it and watch it move. Thank Hallelujah. You, Thank you Jesus. He paid the sin debt. He removed the right of Satan to exert his power over the life of the believer. This is the word of God. Why are you so technical preacher? Because the word of God is explaining to us how it works. And I already told you this morning I believe this is the word of God. He removed the right of Satan to hold you in bondage. He holds the keys of freedom to release you from bondage. He defeated the powers of hell. He has the right to release dunamis into your life through the Holy Spirit because the debt to God for sin has been paid. Don't get tired on me. Bear with me. You got seven minutes. Hmm. Seven minutes. The rest of the week till Wednesday, if you even come on Wednesday, you get to do whatever you want to do. Give me seven more minutes to talk to you about the God of heaven that loved you enough that he would send his son to die for you and to set you free. Hallelujah. 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 Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14. You ready? I'm trying to talk to you about the technicality of the word of God. Why it works. What you're to believe. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. You know what that means? You were born a human being. You were born flesh and blood. That's what you are, right? That's how he created you and I, flesh and blood. He says he also likewise took part of the same. In other words, he became us. Jesus, the eternal son, the one without sin, became flesh and blood. Why did he do that? Here you go. You ready? So that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. Jesus, the sinless one, became flesh so that he could offer up his sinless life as payment for the penalty, not of his sin, but for your sin, for my sin. So that you and I could be restored into the presence of God. To deliver us from the power of the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I got good news for you this morning, church. You're not supposed to fear death. You and I are not supposed to fear death. We're supposed to believe that just as he raised, we also will raise. Hallelujah. That's the only fear that the devil ought to be able to try to hold all over you. That the end result is death. But hallelujah, if you're born again in Christ and your, and your life is hid in Christ, you have nothing to fear of the enemy. You have nothing to fear of death. Praise God. Amen. Talking about the dunamis again. You ready? Mark 530. The dunamis flows from him to you. 
I love this. This is the first time I ever saw this scripture like this, but I'm going to explain something to you about the dunamis of God. Jesus immediately knowing in himself that the dunamis, that's what that word right there in the Greek is. Jesus knowing in himself that the dunamis had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Y'all know this story. Y'all recognize it. It's the woman with the issue of blood. Right. All these years, she's been bound with an issue of blood. She went to every doctor that she knew to go to, and none of these doctors could heal her. And I've already preached on this woman before, but because of her issue of blood, according to the law, she was considered unclean. Just like a leper, a woman that was menstruating, was not allowed to touch other people. I know it's, I know it, we don't understand it, but I'm here to tell you that's what the law of God said. Because it's a type of being in a sinful state. Not a woman that's menstruating today. You're not in a sinful state. That's not the point. The point is, is in the law, it was a type of that. So don't walk out of here feeling weird because the preacher said that. I'm going to shut up because it is weird to keep talking about it. All right. <laughs> she was in this state. Actually, the, the, the diagnosis would be dysfunctional uterine bleeding. She, she just kept bleeding and then nobody could stop it. And she was desperate because she couldn't go to church. She couldn't spend time with her family. If she spent time with her family, she touched them, then they were unclean for a whole week, and they couldn't go to church. She was desperate. She needed change in her life. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit on that right there. Are you desperate? Do you need change in your life? She was going around. She wanted answers. She wanted to help, but nobody could help her. And she finally just said, I don't care what anybody thinks. And then there was a big old crowd already because, because of where Jesus was. And that's what the word press means. He would, the, 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 the crowd was so thick that the people were being pressed. And she will, wove her way through the crowd. I don't know if you've ever been to a concert, but I saw a bunch of concerts. I'm not proud of them. I haven't seen ZZ Top, David Lee Roth. I've seen the whole nine yards. And I used to weave my way through that crowd. And it was hard, boy. But I was like, I'm going to get to the front. Why I wanted to see that, I don't know. But it did. My flesh wanted it. She, her spirit wanted this healing. She weaved her way through that crowd and she just reached down and she grabbed a hold of the hem of his garment. And when she did, all of a sudden the dunamis flowed out of him into her. Immediately she dried up. Immediately that problem that she had was dried up. What I'm here to tell you is that the dunamis flows out of him and into you. And I can't tell you exactly when it's going to flow out of him into you and into your situation. But let me tell you, brother and sister, when it does, you're going to know it. Because that issue is going to dry up. Hallelujah. And that used to be the pain is only going to be the past. Fill in your blank. What is the blank that you need to put in there? What is the pain? What is the problem? Because whatever that problem is, I'm telling you when the dunamis flows, hallelujah, it's no longer going to be the problem. It's going to be the past. Yes. Yes. It's his virtue. It's his power. It's his dunamis. And he will release it because you know why? He wants to give it to you. Yeah, sure. He wants to give it to you. It's his will that you have it. Because he wants to live his life through you. He wants his glory to flow through you. Why? So that other people can see it. So that other people can have hope. Hallelujah. So that they can see the old man. Look, I'm, 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 you know, Robert's my, my, my buddy, man. He, you think people know Robert from the past. I bet you they don't think about that old person no more. Amen. They see a change in that brother. And you too. I'm just trying to say, oh, but preacher, I'm not where. He ain't none of us where we need to be. Thank God we ain't where we used to be. And, and let me tell you something. I've shared this with other people. Some people ain't never going to stop talking about your past. No matter how delivered you are, no matter how free you are, they're going to still want to try to talk about your past. Let them talk about your past. Jesus is your defender. He's your strong tower. He's your refuge in the middle of the storm. He will deliver you and he will clean you up and he will change you and he will cause you to rise up and give you hind feet so that you can walk in elevated places so that you can give glory to the king of glory. Hallelujah. He wants to do that for you. That's his will. I'm going to close with this. Now you can come to the front. And Manny, if you want to come join with her. Danielle, y'all want to come sing a song? I just want you to know that you can have more dunamis. You can have as much dunamis as you want. Amen. Amen. The Word of God says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you shall receive dunamis after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and in Samaria and unto the outermost part of the earth. I'm here to tell you this morning that we are a church that believes in Pentecost. I'm here to tell you this morning that we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe that there is a second baptism of grace that happens after you're saved where the Holy Spirit will fill you to overflowing. So much so that the Holy Spirit comes flowing out of you. And yes, we believe in speaking in other tongues. We believe that that is the initial physical evidence that you have received this baptism. I'm just here to encourage you this morning that you can receive the power of God. You can receive more of the power of God. And I'm just going to tell you that you're invited to come and to be prayed with as they play the music this morning. I just want to encourage you. If you want more of God, hallelujah. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. Come to the altars. Seek the face of God and let us pray together. Lord, nevertheless, give us your dunamis. Give us your dunamis, Lord. We need your grace. Hallelujah.